Dear guests, attention please. Uh, please welcome our keynote speaker at the end of the sixth Lennart Mary conference, Mr. Mart Lahr, former Prime Minister of Estonia and the current member of Estonian Parliament. Mr. Lahr, please. Dear friends, I am very honored to give this year's Lennart Mary lecture and Forgive me to do this seating because this is just more comfortable to me. Ladies and gentlemen, this year is actually very appropriate for Leonard Berry Lecture because in March of this year, the Restored Estonian Republic became older as pre-war republic. And without doubt, this has been one dream of Leonard Mary. He was born in independent Estonia. He has lived in independent Estonia. He has seen how this country was destroyed. He witnessed how the independence of Estonia was restored. And actually one of his dreams was very clearly to see that this time it goes so that we can live in the restored independence longer as old pre-war independence. And that dream has become true. This was very much thanks to this work, what Lennart did. And he really worked very much for this goal because that was a very painful question for him. We discussed many, many times with him how it happened that in 1939, 1940, Estonian independence was lost. Was there possible to do something differently? Was maybe possible to act a little bit differently? Leonard Mary said many times that the Estonian leaders of the 30s were nice guys but they didn't know at all international politics. And that was the reason why he dreamed about the similar conference in Estonia like today. To widen this perspective, to tell to everybody about the international politics and tell also what's happening in Estonia, in Europe. Not many knew very well that loss of independence in 1939, 1940 was the result of international events. And he knew that it was possible, not, maybe not possible totally to avoid, but he was sure, very sure that nevertheless it must be possible to do something differently, to save the Estonian independence, to make it this time last longer. And his answer to all these questions and puzzles was one, that is Europe. That made him very big European. And namely, he was the politician who was very much behind this drive towards Europe back. And of course, all these plans were very much discussed as well. And of course, we didn't have any illusions. Uh, we understood that in Europe we found, find something what we don't like. Maybe something what we think that uh, is not this what we want. Not new also that Europe is not the same like he is remembering in the childhood. But nevertheless, we were satisfied because rules are rules. When they are commonly in place, we must obey them. And that was understandable. 
and in most widest teams we are never deemed that when we are in the European Union we must deal with the Greece debt and save the Russian oligarchs money from the Cyprus banks. That was not what we guessed. And uh, actually we have seen a lot of other things as well. We have understood that in Europe today uh, very often uh, things are like in George Orwell's book, Animal Farm, that these all animals are equal, but some animals are more equal. And some countries are just doing what they want. The rules are there, and some countries follow them, and other countries just not. And uh, that is what is very hard to understand. And especially it's hard to explain to the people, and that's the reason for this north and south divide, what we are witnessing today. Because you understand when you must live by rules. You like them or not, but you don't understand when some countries just are not doing this. And this is not understandable. The all the situation what we see in today's Europe is at the same time quite worrying. And when we see it today, we can only say, don't worry, be happy. The worst is only coming. <laughs> because even when we dream that in tomorrow, all current economical problems of Europe will be solved. Unemployment will go down. Financial stability will be restored. Uh, growth will be restored. Actually, new problems are only coming. We can list only some of them. Starting, by example, from the fact that we are spending significantly more as we earn. We are living on debt, and a lot of our welfare is based on debt. This is on emptiness, and in one day it will end, and this day will be quite terrible. The pension systems of different European countries, also some Nordic countries, will go down in 10 or 15 years because there is just no money. The services, what we are just now providing, are not sufficient for the future on elderly population. It's very good to have people who are living older. It's no catastrophe, of course, but it will demand a lot of more money and very different attitudes. But the current attitudes are the old one. And current welfare state couldn't guarantee for us in near future any more welfare. That is reality and mathematics. That is nothing to do. And just looking on this mathematics, we know that the bad times are only coming. The second huge problem, which is very hard to solve, is seen in the streets of London, Paris, and in these days of Stockholm. These results of uh, immigration. Immigration is, as such, is nothing bad, of course. But in the current form, when the people and Europe is trying to solve some other problems with immigration, it can become the disease very easily. The first generation of immigrants is thankful because they are remembering their old countries. They remember how bad was the life there, how dangerous, and how good is life compared to this with their new homeland. The second generation is having very different attitudes. For them, the past in the homeland is not existing. 
and in the new homeland, they are just living a more bad life as the local citizens or that they feel. And so the name burning the, the schools or police station fight for freedom, which is very hard to understand. But that was never what I understand one of the demonstrator, demonstrators in Stockholm just said, fight for freedom to burn, freedom for burn, and to attack the people. That is a modern disease, and I am afraid we are just now at the beginning of this disease. And the only way to get out of this is something what we don't want to do, and that is we don't want to produce any more children. Europe is a little bit like the continent. The birth rates of most of its member states are so low that the problems are very clearly there. And when we couldn't concentrate on this, on when we couldn't concentrate to give to the Europe more children, we will really lose a lot of, lot of things. And uh, it, uh, of course, today looks maybe a little bit question far away, but it will be reality of these results, I must say, in 10, 15 years. We see the growth of the new populism very much coming as a protest towards migration. And very often this Populism is connected with, uh, with anti-European attitude, very strong anti-European attitude. We are witnessing the situation where there is not only economical divide, but also political divide in Europe. We see mostly in the north of Europe governments who are responsible, who are not populist, and as a result are quite unpopular. Or at, at least they are more and more unpopular as before. That it's possible to predict that in coming elections in Europe, we will see the significant growth of populism and everywhere. Because it's very hard to explain to the people why they couldn't live well. In Estonia, for example, it's possible, yes, to uh, raise significantly our debt from this very low burden, for example, raise the free times, take the huge loans, and raise the salaries of every state servant two times. Everybody will be happy at the beginning. Then to pay back this debt, take the new debt. Estonian debt level is so low that it's possible theoretically. And so on, so on. It's of course very dangerous politics. It's a little bit, sorry to say, but like pissing to your pants. At the beginning, it is very warm and nice but it comes very quickly, quite uh, nasty. And I will not suggest it. <laughs> but listening to advice, what some good people are giving to us, and uh, uh, it's exactly this advice. And uh, to fight all such of problems, what we see, to really to build the Europe, what we want, to have for it more role in the world, not to have the double standards like at home. We follow one standard and that's not very welcome by the business. And then we let the business go abroad and follow no standards there. We just forget the people from Thailand or somewhere else in Asia working in the 
very bad conditions for European companies, for all of us, because I'm afraid we have quite much clothes from these factories uh, at, in this room. And of course, we are not looking very much to the future. We are not wanting to invest to our security. This is to our future. Uh, in every meeting of European Union, defense ministers or NATO, everybody is gathering and raising their hands to raise the defense uh, for budgets to 2% of the GDP, like it's commonly, again, commonly decided. And then nothing follows. Only what follows is that the budgets will be decreased again and again. I must say it's a very short-sighted policy towards the future. And to really avoid all this, we desperately in Europe need the politicians like Leonard Mary was. We need the politicians who are ready to tell the, frankly, the truth, even when they are very unpleasant, and prepare people on this what will come. Because we mostly know what is coming and what will come, but we don't want, by different reasons, to say it loudly because it's politically not correct. That very was never politically correct. He actually told very often what he really had in mind. It was not very nice for the prime ministers. Trust me, I know. <laughs> but it was what the people liked. And this united the people around some big, big goals making them part of something more important, as there may be everyday life, which was quite miserable. But they were part of this big dream, European dream, and they, that make them more participating and more responsible, and that making people happy. The people very often thought that the governments in these times were lazy and stupid, but the, government, but the countries, by some reasons, are moving on the right track. And that was quite good understanding, because currently they look to tell, I think more and more that the governments are still lazy and stupid, but the countries are sometimes moving to the wrong track, and that is dangerous, because when the people are having firm trust on future, they believe in Europe, I think everything is achievable. But in the current situation, when we Estonians, who are always very critical, very ironic and uh, not very tolerant people, we are somehow have got the, are getting the biggest optimists in Europe, I think that's absurd. <laughs> and actually, it's only showing how in how bad situation we are in Europe today, I must say. I am happy for my countrymen, but I am very unhappy for other Europe. And, and to really somehow to get it over all of it, we need to concentrate more on this, that we are not looking at Europe as some technical project. But like the Lena did it, it was mostly about question of ideas and values. Because today Europe looks for people very technical and very far away. It's like you having the neighbor who is always right and always perfect. He's quite boring. And you don't like him. <laughs> it's a little bit the same with Europe. It's, he's always right. Everything what is done is uh, writing. It's always perfect. It's, uh, there is no other way, but it's quite far away. We must bring the Europe back to the people 
Maybe sometimes we must try to be a little bit more crazy, like Lennart was very often, doing all these crazy things and drawing the rivers to the globuses of other foreign secretaries or so on. We must do something what is not unexpected. Maybe sometimes something what is not right, but what is near to the people's heart. And when we touch this, we can win them to common out. We must get them with to build the common future, the common Europe, but it's not sterile, but very living and vivid. And I think that's a dream, what Lennart had and what we must have for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Would you mind taking some questions? Oh, yes. mm -hmm. Do you have a mic? Okay. Mark, thank you very much for that wonderful speech. A couple of things. Um, in this part of the world, it was very unusual for the president to get along with his government. I'm thinking like Bawensa with his solidarity governments, Václav Havel, Václav Klaus, they had all these dysfunctionalities. But yet here in Estonia somehow, the elder statesman Lennart Meri got along very well with, of course, his uh, government led by you and, uh, and a bunch of other kids at that time in their late 20s, early 30s. I um, was wondering what made this chemistry possible, which was the exception. And on the second uh, question, the demographics of, uh, that you mentioned, very alarming uh, for Europe and the immigration. Uh, but I read somewhere that some immigrants, uh, for example, from India, uh, Hindus in England or Buddhists from other parts of Asia, uh, do extremely well here in Europe and also in the United States where they emigrate. The second generation, third generation even surpass in education and skills uh, you know, the local native uh, white population. So maybe it's not immigrants per se, but where they come from. Do you have some thoughts on that and what Europe can do to attract more immigrants from those countries? Thank you. Uh, on last, I have not such kind of expert, I must say, that to make this difference so strongly. But in some ways, you probably right. There is some difference. But uh, I must say, this is what we must study, and study very much what we are not doing, because this is very crucial questions for us today. And uh, it's not possible to move them somewhere to the future. It's always, of course, to cover all this not very pleasant question with uh, such of problems like homosexual marriages and so on. But it will not last very long, because this bad question doesn't disappear. Uh, how we, how it was possible in Estonia to have the good context between the president and government? Of course, there was not so much about personal chemistry. This, of course, too. But as I soon made a little bit hint, it was not easy to be the prime minister on the time when Leonard Mary was president. <laughs> but uh, why it must be, be easy to be the prime minister? The kings, I must say, are a lot of more pleasant as presidents because they are going only riding, mostly, or making the marriages. Uh, but uh, why we were so united, I think the main was that we shared the same team and same understanding. And that made us work very well together. Even when we had tactical disagreements on many things, I think these main goals and uh, main themes were the same. And main question, how, how to avoid the same fate what Estonia had 
in 1939 and 40. And now we can say that we were successful in it. Estonian nation was successful, to be more precise. We all together were. Because we did a lot of friends and most of them are sitting in this room. So thank you all to make the teams true. One more question in the first row here, Anders. Thank you very much, uh, Martin. Lovely to see you again. I have uh, a question. Uh, Martin Wolf uh, all the time attacks the poor Baltic uh, countries uh, and say that they are irrelevant, they are too small, they can do it well, others can not. Uh, you know, I think that your reforms in the early 90s were the best we saw in any formerly communist uh, countries. So I propose uh, uh, Martin Wolf's question uh, over to you. Uh, was your kind of reforms, or is it uh, reproducible in other uh, countries? Can big countries undertake as radical reforms as you so successfully did here in Estonia? Thank you. Of course, you know the total answer is no, because the question is sometimes the reforms are not very precisely understood. What we did, actually, to be frank, we sometimes did understood ourselves too. Not, uh, uh, but uh, mm, some reforms, for example, part of tax reforms, are mostly uh, made again. It's and also in the bigger countries, including Russia, by example, where it is one of the few reforms at all, but works more or less. Uh, the other reforms, by example, on the fight of corruption are done quite well in some other countries, by example, like in Georgia was. I couldn't say nothing about the current situation, but it was quite, quite well at least. Uh, I think the one main problem sometimes, uh, what is not understood, is on the public service and how important it is. And many, many countries miss this uh, more or less. Had to explain this that uh, maybe you, you need, uh, need the public service, what is really professional, capable, and uh, what is not corrupt is not easy. I, I have this experience, I know that you are having as well some sad experience. But it's quite a crucial question. And then more, I'm looking on these different countries and reforms. I think this is one of the crucial questions to explain why reforms fail very often, more often as we want. Are there more questions? Okay, one more. Uh, for non-Estonians who come to your country, what is one of the things that is very interesting to see the politicians, high-ranking politicians, with a few or sometimes no bodyguards? Are you optimistic about the future? And do you believe that you can always be in this situation, you can keep this situation forever? Yes, no. Estonian situation, I think yes. I think in the most, at least, it's now completely in the hand of Estonian themselves. Estonian themselves, of course, we are talented people, we can fail everything. Uh, but I hope uh, this time not. Uh, because I think uh, all other conditions are really, really strongly built now. I think the main work is done and we will see where it goes in the future. I hope myself that only better. Thank you very much, Mart. <laughs>